nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Welcome back, uh, everybody. So today we're going to talk about quantum cryptography. Uh, but first, I'm going to start kind of explaining a bit of background on classical cryptography. So if you already know all this, bear with me, but some of it may be new. Uh, so cryptography, in general, of course, you know the concept is that you have uh, a sender and a receiver, and you're trying to avoid eavesdropping. So you're basically encoding information uh, with uh, some sort of key, and then using that key to encode it in a way that only uh, the recipient knows how to decode it. So in principle, uh, this is like a very secure method. However, there is a problem, which is that uh, you have to distribute the key in a secure manner. Okay, And so particularly if the sender and recipient are uh, distributed uh, across a large distance from one another, this is very challenging. Um, and so there are, of course, uh, approaches right now to try to solve this. One is called RSA which is an algorithm for exchanging public keys. So basically everybody has both a public key and a private key. And then the idea is that you use somebody else's public key and your private key to encrypt information, send it to the recipient, and then the recipient uses their private key plus the public key from the sender to decrypt it. And so this is all based on the concept of pick t picking large numbers that are factors of two primes. Okay, so then the concept is because both of these primes are very large, it's very hard to uh, brute force this problem. And so theoretically, this scales more or less like an exponent. I mean, strictly speaking, it looks like this kind of relationship. You can see it's not exactly an exponent, but it's somewhat approaching that. So that seems like, in, at first glance, it seems very reassuring. Okay, uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, it is widely used. Uh, in a lot of uh, applications, so if you ever used anything with public key infrastructure, or if you used web certificates, um, or you use secure email. Um, and so uh, this can include like pretty good privacy or GNU Privacy Guard Outlook has a feature like this with secure keys and so on. The problem is that uh, there are a couple of uh, flaws in this methodology which I guess you could call classical cryptography. One is that it's already been shown you can brute force RSA keys that are actually quite long, up to 768 bits, uh, which is actually longer than a lot of keys that are used today. Okay, And there are also like some attacks where you can uh, potentially cut down the time and effort for brute forcing solutions by factors of millions. Like let's say 16 million. I'll show you an example in a minute. Okay, and then there's another problem, which is just that as Moore's law continues, at least to some extent, then you have computational power increasing. So that means if you had a 769-bit key, maybe it seems secure today, but tomorrow it won't be because now we have twice as much computing power. Um, and then uh, there's even another problem, which some of you may have heard about a few years ago, which is that the RSA algorithm at one point had a pseudo-random algorithm which was called deterministic ram random bit generator. And that alone actually is very suspicious, a deterministic random bit. So it's actually possible to essentially uh, know in advance what random information it would generate. Uh, and there was a specific uh, security agency, maybe I'm not supposed to say which one, that knew uh, basically all of this and actually was exploiting that to a great extent. Now, of course, this specific algorithm was dropped because the publicity was overwhelmingly negative, right, as you can imagine, because this is supposed to be a way to secure information, and it was very easy backdoor to get around that uh, information. But at the same time, that, that means that there could be other flaws we don't even know about. So I think for many reasons, you could say it doesn't satisfy basic security conditions. Just to really convince you, hopefully, I want to show you uh, some work from Dan Bonet at Stanford just really briefly. And so basically the idea is you have like a web server and client, right? Could be you. Uh, <laughs> and then the session key that is created maybe has 64 bits. So that means theoretically there's two to the 64 possibilities. And then the eavesdropper who might be like basically a person in the middle of these two uh, 
like sender and recipient pairs, uh, would see uh, like a certain amount of information that's essentially the public key associated with this problem. And if you assume that uh, basically the, uh, the overall key is essentially a product of two values, the public key and the private key, um, and then both of these are less than uh, basically, are, are basically less than half plus two of the bits that are used in the overall key, uh, which is fairly likely, like at least 20%, then you can actually create now a lookup table. And then this lookup table here takes uh, time on the order of two to the 34th uh, operations, which is actually not horribly bad, right? It's on the order of maybe a few billion. And then you can test uh, for each of those possibilities if, if uh, the, the private key is in the table. And so that means like in uh, a time that's on the order of a few billion operations, now you can test this. So that means you cut the computational time by a factor of uh, 16 million just by getting a little bit lucky, which is not extremely unlikely. Now, obviously, if you want to guarantee with a higher probability, it takes slightly longer, but the key point is that actually there are very easy ways to attack textbook RSA, right? So. So all of this is just to convince you that <laughs> we, we can't necessarily expect uh, to be completely secure with current approaches. And so then that actually leads me to the next uh, point, which is the core point of today, which is to talk about quantum key distribution. Like, why is this important? OK, so, so now the concept is instead of using uh, classical algorithms that can be hacked, to use quantum mechanics to solve key distribution. Okay, and this actually was studied actually uh, decades ago in 84, believe it or not. Um, at the time, it was very hard to implement, obviously, but at least theoretically, uh, it was proposed uh, by Bennett and Brassard. Okay, and so basically the concept is uh, have quantum mechanical way of exchanging keys. Uh, so basically, uh, you, you have a secure set of keys uh, at the sender and receiver. And these can also be one-time keys. So even if they do get cracked theoretically, which is very hard, then they can also be just reformed. Um, then you can encrypt messages uh, using conventional channels at this point. So you don't need a huge amount of quantum uh, exchange of information at this stage. OK, so just to briefly step through the BB84 setup, as they call it. Um, so the idea is essentially you have a set of photons that are being exchanged uh, between Alice and Bob. And I think Ken Body may have heard this before. <laughs> uh, and then uh, basically there are two bases uh, for uh, the polarizations. Uh, so they could be either 0 and 90 degrees, or they can be 45 and 135 degrees. OK, so then the idea is that Alice sends uh, random photons using uh, one of the possible polarizations, there are four total, 0, 45, 90, and 135. And then Bob uses his polarizers to measure those polarizations. And he may be using either basis. And so actually that means that in general, they may not agree on every exchange, uh, but they should on average agree on half because basically each of them have two possibilities. So that means four total between Alice and Bob of which two are like plus plus and then cross cross, right? So plus plus and cross cross, you can actually use that data. And so this just showing you uh, essentially a schematic of like how do Alice and Bob communicate with each other? And so you can see that like essentially Alice has a series of bits, zeros and ones, and then she's kind of randomly flipping the filter um, and therefore the polarization of each photon. And then Bob is measuring just a random set of detections. And then he's sometimes measuring data. So you can see, like, sometimes he measures a 1 uh, here. Uh, but then you don't get to retain this because this actually was a 45 degree polarization, which disagreed with the 0, 90 basis. But you can see here, uh, she sent something at 90 degrees. And then this basically agreed with his 0, 90 degree basis. So you can. Uh, measure the zero and then retain this zero. So about half of these overall get to be retained in the system, right? So in principle, this is actually a very simple system. You just have to be able to send a photon from A to B with some polarizers that are super cheap. You can buy them on Newport's website. And then, <laughs> and then you can retain half of this data.
And, the, and you can exchange as many bits as you want doing this way. Now, the thing that's really important about this is what happens with eavesdroppers. So this is a much different scenario than the classical case, because if Eve uh, uses a filter that's aligned with Alice, she can actually recover uh, what would the original polarization was. Um, of course, if she doesn't, then she won't get any information. But the most important thing is she will influence the original photon and be unable to retransmit. And so this actually is called the no-cloning theorem. And so be because uh, of time constraints, I'm not going to try to prove the no-cloning theorem. But basically, it just says that if you prepare a quantum state, you can't make an exact replica of it without destroying the original, more or less. Uh, so that means that you can't just take a single quantum state and then just make infinite number of copies and then pretend that you didn't look at it or something. Like, it's not that easy because quantum states are inherently superposition of multiple individual states. So when you measure it, you collapse that state and you can't just reproduce the state. I mean, you can kind of guess what maybe it should have been, but you don't necessarily know. And in this case, actually, it's supposed to be random, right? So that means that it's very hard to reconstruct it, right? And so that means that when this starts happening, Eve starts eavesdropping, as her name suggested, then that means that Bob can actually tell that she's there. And so therefore, uh, this, this data that's being generated in the key exchange can be discounted. And then, of course, you can basically wait, in principle, for eavesdropper to stop eavesdropping. Or you can just uh, switch to different uh, communication protocol or perhaps uh, find a new uh, line for communication. Right? So there are a lot of workarounds at that point. But the key point is you know if this is happening. OK, so basically, it's all, all being driven by this no-cloning theorem. And that makes it impossible to intercept messages. And this is real fact. Um, I've actually had uh, senior people tell me that they didn't believe that this was real, but I, I can assure you it's real. OK. There is uh, one flaw, I should admit, though, uh, which is that uh, this kind of thing is susceptible to noise and particularly loss. OK. And so the reason is twofold. Like, first of all, if you have noise, then that can flip you out of your original quantum state. And so that would be uh, basically uh, causing a loss of coherence in the system. Um, and then you can also have absorption of the photons, which means that you won't receive any bet at Bob, okay, or vice versa. If Bob is communicating with Alice, then Alice won't be able to receive any, any bits, right? And so that means that noise and eavesdropping actually kind of like blend together to some extent. So you really need a, a high quality channel for this to work, okay? So it's not necessarily something that we're going to immediately do like in a trans-Pacific manner. However, in addition to doing like short distance networks, um, there have also been some recent uh, papers showing that you can do this with satellites. And so there are actually a couple of different strategies to get those kind of high quality channels. Um, and I should mention for sake of being complete that there are also these so-called quantum one-way functions that are of interest. And so basically the idea is that you have some sort of uh, mapping between a private key and then a public key. And then the idea is that you can never uh, guess what the private key is, even if you know all the public keys. And so this, this is something I think maybe you could come up with a concept to do it classically, but I'm not convinced that uh, this, this is as easy to do classically. So there's interest now also in looking at quantum one-way functions as kind of an uh, alternative or essentially uh, addition to the quantum key distribution DB84 algorithm. OK, so uh, basically, there are a number of companies that are getting involved with this. And I should also add, like, several uh, uh, countries are also getting in the act here. I mean, these are kind of like uh, the most well-known companies. Uh, so ID Quantique has been around for a while. And they're doing like tens of kilometers of fiber-based uh, key exchange. Uh, and it's also happening like in uh, in US and Japan and England, right? So this is actually like kind of a global thing. But I think right now uh, also like several countries in EU as well as uh, China have gotten heavily involved and have launched quantum satellites for quantum key distribution. And there's also uh, a lot of interest now in the US in trying to basically catch up and perhaps even uh, exceed 
uh, this, this uh, capability. Um, some of the security agencies have already stopped, started talking about what happens in a world where all important communications are quantum encrypted. Okay, so it, it could be a different world in many ways. Uh, and here are a few references if you want to read more. I know that was very quick.